This is Franklin Rye, and welcome back to Political Spirits. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated, at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, today is Father's Day, so let's cover some subjects related to fatherhood. You know that I love to go to the movies, so let's talk about my favorite films regarding fatherhood. They don't have to be exclusively about fatherhood, but fatherhood has to be a key component. I'll give you three of my favorite films, but let's make sure that at least one of them is on the old side, just for the sake of having a little historical component to this episode. Let's categorize these three films as the least realistic but most likely to be the father we secretly desire to be, the most realistic but least likely to be the father we admit we are, and the one that for the benefit of society it would be best if we all were. So with those hints, do you have any idea which films I'm talking about? Let's start with the least realistic but most likely to be the father we secretly desire to be. You have to admit that every father secretly thinks they are or are capable of being the film equivalent of the superhero. You've seen those guys driving down the interstate with a mattress tied to the roof of their car, and they've actually stuck their arm out, and their hand is grabbing the top of the mattress. Like, yeah, I got it. Sure you do. You're driving 65 miles per hour with a mattress on the top of your car. Trust me, if that rope breaks or the knot slips, you don't have anything. So am I talking about an actual superhero depicted as a father in a film? No, not really. I'm talking about a father depicted in the film taking the over-the-top actions that you see out of Hollywood movie making to protect his daughter. I'm talking about a very particular set of skills. What father hasn't watched the movie Taken and secretly dreamed that if his daughter was ever in jeopardy, he would be able to dispatch a seemingly endless stream of despicable crooks and kidnappers to rescue his daughter? From the moment our kids first look up at us when the doctor places them in our arms, every father thinks about protecting his kids. And I suspect it's especially true if the baby's a little girl. I know there's probably someone out there who thinks that last statement is sexist. Frankly, I don't care. So what's the movie that's the most realistic, but the least likely to portray the father that we admit we are? Well, that movie's Finding Nemo. No, I don't mean that we're all secretly animated clownfish. I mean that the neurotic Albert Brooks characterization of a father too nervous to let his kid take risks hits home for a lot of us. And I suspect that's particularly the case in America these days, as we've pushed off having kids until later in life. But the fatherhood part of Finding Nemo that we all love is the links to which Nemo's father went to find him. I can't imagine losing one of my kids, but I'm sure that if that happened, just like scores of other fathers, I would stop at nothing to find them. Even if it involved riding the East Australia Current with a turtle that sounds like Jeff Spicoli, from Ridgebot High. Finally, what's the movie that portrays the father that for the benefit of society, it would be best if we were all like him? To Kill a Mockingbird. If you've seen the movie, you remember Gregory Peck's performance as Atticus Finch. Not only does Atticus Finch portray a great supportive father to his kids, including, of course, the unforgettable Scout, but he stands as a figure that not only his kids, but everyone in the community can look up to as he risks his legal career and his own and his family's safety by standing against racism. A quick side note. What movies, which are either about fatherhood or feature fatherhood in some significant respect, break you up emotionally? In other words, what are the real tearjerkers out there? In my view, in my experience, there are two out there that clearly lead the pack. The first I'll mention is Field of Dreams. I'm talking about the closing scene, 
when it finally becomes clear that the he, and if you build it, he will come, that Ray Kinsella has been mysteriously hearing throughout the movie, is John Kinsella, Ray's long-dead father. When Ray, so perfectly played by Kevin Costner, discovers that John is playing catcher on that magical baseball field and asks his father if he wants to have a catch, I suspect that millions who lost their fathers long ago react the same way as I do. The other movie is much less well-known, but it produces an even stronger reaction in me. That movie is called My Life, and it stars Michael Keaton and Nicole Kidman. It's the story of a father who's dying of cancer while his wife is pregnant. Knowing that he'll likely die before the child is born, he decides to make a series of videos of life lessons for the kid so that he can know his father and benefit from his father's knowledge, even though he won't be alive to convey it. If you're in the mood for that kind of film, few are better. I highly recommend it. Next topic. Communism is a mile high. I've heard so many ridiculous and disturbing and over-the-top things said by leftist activists and politicians in America in the last couple of years that you would think there's nothing left that could be said that I'd find truly shocking. But this week, to my dismay, I learned that there is something left that could still meet that standard. This week, Candy C.D. Baca became the presumptive winner of a Denver City Council seat based on a nearly five-point lead over the incumbent, although military and overseas ballots are still being counted. And I learned that she had said something at a candidate panel discussion in April that just flat-out blew my mind that it was coming out of the mouth of a politician in the United States of America. The fact that any politician in America would utter the words that she said is just the latest evidence of how dangerous the extent to which the Democratic Party has moved to the left, has become. So what did she say? She said, I don't believe that our current economic system actually works. Capitalism by design is extractive, and in order to generate profit in a capitalist system, something has to be exploited. That's land, labor, or resources. And I think that we're in late-phase capitalism and we know it doesn't work, and we've got to move into something new. And I believe in community ownership of land, labor, resources, and distribution of those resources. And so whatever that morphs into, I think, is what will serve community the best, and I'm excited to usher it in by any means necessary. Close quote. She's saying that she believes in full-on communism. She's saying that she believes in community ownership of not only land resources and the distribution of those resources, but also labor. Community ownership of labor. She's hit all of the tenets of communism. Notice that she criticizes capitalism as being extractive and designed to exploit, and then says that labor is exploited under capitalism. She's literally saying that if the company gives you a job and pays you, they are exploiting you. It's not an exchange where you offer the services of your labor to the company and they offer you money and benefits in exchange for it. No, in her view, it's exploitive. So I suppose there are those who would give her the benefit of the doubt and would say that no, she's just saying that the company would be taking advantage of the employee because the company would make more money than the employee. But that argument doesn't fly when you look at the full text of her statement, because she says she believes in community ownership of labor. In other words, she believes it's exploitive for a private company to pay an employee, but it's a positive, what she actually believes in, for the community rather than the individual to own his own labor. That's full-on communism. Any person with any knowledge of the horrific history of communism 
and the fact that it resulted in corpses stacked like cordwood to the tune of over 100 million of them in the 20th century should be incapable of expressing support for that corrupt ideology. But if you look at this woman's background, you'll find that it includes that most loaded of titles, Community Organizer. Perhaps that explains it. You can watch the video for yourself in multiple places on the Internet, including The Daily Caller, American Thinker, and WRVA Radio. Next topic. Chinese Social Credit System in America Revisited You may recall that way back in Episode 17, we talked about whether we were in the beginning of a Chinese social credit system in America. I concluded that we were in the beginning stages of such a system, but unlike in China, in America it was being administered by corporations rather than the government. The system was effectively in place because corporations were essentially all taking the same approach in towing the left-wing, politically correct line. Either because their executive management actually agreed with those positions, or because of fear of the left-wing outrage mob. Well, now we have further evidence that we're in the beginnings of such a system, and as been the norm recently, much of that evidence comes from the conduct of Facebook. In an article entitled, Exclusive Facebook's Process to Label You a Hate Agent Revealed in the June 13 edition of Breitbart by Alam Bakari. It's revealed that if you identify with or associate with a person or entity which Facebook considers to be a hate entity, then Facebook may categorize you as a quote, hate agent. Close quote. Likewise, if you self identify with or advocate for a, quote, designated hateful ideology, close quote, Facebook may categorize you as a hate agent. The author advises that Facebook has determined that Islam critic Tommy Robinson constitutes a hate entity. Therefore, identifying with him would cause an individual to risk being labeled a hate agent. Purportedly, that's one of the reasons why political and social commentator Paul Joseph Watson was banned from the platform. Specifically, Paul Joseph Watson's violation was apparently praising Tommy Robinson and interviewing him on YouTube. They would even categorize you as a hate agent if you're found to be in possession of what they consider to be hate paraphernalia or hate symbols. As the author notes, Facebook didn't clarify what exactly they considered to be hate symbols. But he does point out the fact that purported anti-racism groups have been labeling things like cartoon frogs and the OK hand symbol as hate symbols. Perhaps most terrifying is the fact that the documents in question say that Facebook will characterize you as a hate agent for statements made in private if they're later made public. Think about the amount of information which Facebook has and the decisions they're making to label individuals based on the political views of Facebook management, perhaps only those of Mark Zuckerberg. I have no doubt, based on what I've seen and read, that the management of the Silicon Valley tech companies see things from a very left-of-center position. That doesn't necessarily mean that when they implement speech restrictions, they've chosen to adopt them on the basis of their political views. But from what we've seen thus far, it's apparent that they have in fact been heavily influenced by their own political views. Moreover, some have even acknowledged the left-leaning perspective of their employees and acknowledged that it has caused politically conservative employees to feel that they must suppress their own views. How on earth could a company like that ever apply speech restrictions in a way that doesn't disproportionately adversely affect political views on the right? unless the company took extremely aggressive steps to stop it. I've seen no such aggressive steps to resolve the situation from any of the Silicon Valley tech giants. Facebook is the dominant social media company. In its space, there really is no competitor. It's critical to social engagement. It's critical to nearly an endless number of businesses. 
It's critical to political candidates. It's critical to political commentators. Now think about the fact that this company, with essentially no competitors in its space, is throwing people off of its platform because it disagrees with their politics. We can all argue about whether particular public figures' political positions are correct, incorrect, wise, ill-advised, appropriate, inappropriate, or hateful. But the bottom line is Facebook is not facilitating that argument if it thinks those figures are hateful or associate with individuals, entities, or ideologies which Facebook considers hateful. And Facebook is a digital public square. It isn't leaving it to users to determine whether individuals, entities, or ideologies are hateful. It's making that determination itself and then preventing its users from accessing those individuals, entities, or ideologies on the system, even though the system is in fact a digital public square. Just look at some of the figures which Facebook has listed as potential hate agents. Paul Joseph Watson, Tommy Robinson, Candace Owens, Brigitte Gabrielle, and Carl Benjamin, the British politician and online political commentator previously known as Sargon of Akkad. Every one of those figures is a commentator on the right side of the political spectrum. It's certainly open to discussion as to which, if any of them, are on the far right, but regardless, that's exactly what it should be, a discussion. That's not the approach that Facebook is taking. They're throwing commentators off of their platform, and the commentators they're targeting are disproportionately those on the right. And there is no way that a single company and a single CEO should ever be able to have this level of impact on political discourse in America. It's unprecedented. Even in the age of the so-called robber barons in America, none of those industrialists ever had that level of impact on political discourse. Sure, they had an impact on politicians, but they didn't have the ability to control political discussion among the general populace in any way even remotely close to what we now have with Facebook. And Facebook owns Instagram, so it owns the entity which is arguably an actual competitor. In the end, I don't see how the Silicon Valley titans will avoid some sort of ramped-up regulation or antitrust action. I recently read The Social Media Upheaval, a book by University of Tennessee law professor Glenn Harlan Reynolds, who blogs at instapundit.com. Reynolds takes the position that rather than attempting to regulate the company's restrictions of speech, the matter should be approached from an antitrust perspective and the company's broken up. In the case of Facebook, that would presumably involve them losing control of Instagram. I get his point. He's worried that trying to regulate the extent to which the tech companies can restrict speech will give the government too much of an opportunity to play political games with how the speech can be regulated. In his view, it's much better to limit the government action to regulation of antitrust by forcing the companies to give up control of the numerous subsidiaries with competing platforms. My concern is that might not go far enough. The reason? Because as I said, and as we've seen, these tech companies have been remarkably consistent in their views of political issues and political speakers. What difference does it make if you split up control if the same decisions are made with regard to which individuals should be thrown off the platforms and why? The way that tech companies have approached this issue is part of a broader split within society. And the extent of that split is not as apparent as it should be, because the public is self-censoring, as we talked about starting all the way back in Episode 3, Self-Censoring Public. The best evidence of the extent of the split is the election of Donald Trump, and it certainly hasn't disappeared in the nearly three years since that event. There has always been a disparity between those with the bullhorns in our society with the amplified ability to have their voices heard. In the past, there was a certain orthodoxy, a certain centrism, whether center-left or center-right, which had that elevated voice. The media would tend to speak within that range, certainly center-left in my lifetime, 
and when we would hear from those outside of that range, it was a curiosity. Sometimes those from outside of that range managed to push open that window of acceptable views which would become part of that amplified public discussion, a window which is sometimes referred to as the Overton window. An example of that was when Ronald Reagan advanced the cause of conservatism to the point it was so clearly within that window that the media was essentially forced to acknowledge it, if reluctantly. But what has been happening for some time now, spurred by academia, the leftward move of the Democratic Party under President Obama, the media, which transitioned from left-wing bias to active participation with the Democrats during the George W. Bush administration, and then full-on performance as the opposition party under the Trump administration, and now aggressively enforced by the social media giants, is that the window has been split. On one side, the left side, it's nearly wide open. Virtually any view on the left, no matter how extreme, is expressed and typically not attacked by the mainstream media. Think about what the Denver Council candidate, who appears to have been elected, said. Thirty years ago, how would we have reacted to a local council candidate endorsing taking private property, all private property, from the citizens and holding it communally? Endorsing considering those citizens' labor to be the property of the community rather than that of the individual citizens themselves. There would have been an unparalleled uproar. But now, virtually nothing. Why? Because the window on the left is wide open. But on the right, it's nearly closed, and it's becoming more closed every day as the Silicon Valley tech companies crack down. With each new instance of deplatforming, what is viewed as acceptable speech on the right becomes more and more limited. And it isn't just the speech itself. It's also even associating with or mentioning in anything other than a completely negative vein those who engage in the speech which has been limited. In other words, Silicon Valley is building on the self-censoring which we talked about in Episode 3 by adding on actual censoring. It has to stop. For the sake of our republic, it has to stop. We cannot succeed unless we're a free marketplace of ideas. And I'll continue participating in that free marketplace of ideas with the next episode next week. Please join me and tell your friends about political spirits. And follow me on Twitter at Franklin Rye. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening.